And then we're going to preach today from Galatians chapter 5. Uh, give the Lord a big hand. Come on. Amen. We preach the word by His grace. Now, preaching to you today from Galatians chapter 5. We're going to continue from last week. We did um, chapter 5, verse 1 to 12. Today, we're going to do verse 13 to 26. That will sort of wrap up um, chapter 5 before the pastors come in um, to do chapter 6. A story is told here in 1912. West Texas, United States. It was a year of, well, it was prolonged depression. And then there's this guy by the name of Ira Yates. He started his life as a rancher. He's like a shepherd boy kind of stuff. And then by hard work, through hard work, he acquired a grocery business, earned his first pot of gold, a, pri a princely sum of $5,000. Now, he had a dream. He wanted to be a rancher, or so-called a shepherd, and to raise cattle, sheep, and stuff. And then the opportunity came. Well, a seller came to him. He says, now, Ira Yates, I have a plot of land, 16,000 acres, and I'm going to sell it to you. You're going to take it or leave it. And Ira Yates had that dream. And then he gathered, mustered all the finances that he could. 5000 from his earnings as a grocer, grocer seller. And then he took on a loan and a mortgage and he bought this 16,000 acres of land in West Texas. Now, 16,000 acres, how big it is? Um, it's like four and a half times of Amokyo region then, then the time. Bought the land. And then so he thought life will be good, raising cattle, being a rancher, and then shepherding sheep. But life was tough then and then. Took out a loan, $16,000, and then he had a hard time making ends meet. Why? Because the business wasn't doing well. And then as hard as he tried, he couldn't pay for his bill and his mortgages. He was struggling. But unknown to him, right, this land that is bought, possess immense potential. The resource is there, ready for him to tap on it. And then there came a point of time, he says, now the life is so hard, is living on government subsidy. And then he thought of a plan. Maybe, perhaps, I'll find a way. He got a seismographer, which is those who are trying to explore for oil. He says, come to my land and try to explore for oil. Well, the seismographer says, no, 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 no. Your place sucks, man. There's no oil there. We are not going to give it any try. But then he says, come and take a look. And so the seismographer came. They did a wildcat well. What's a wildcat well? Well, it's just try, lah, you know. If you get it, if you drill, you get it, then there's oil. So they went there, they checked out the land, and then they started drilling this wildcat well. 300 meters deep into the ground, they hit checkpoint. And then friends... It, they hit jackpot and then oil, oil. They found oil. It is not just dripping with oil. It is not just flowing with oil, friends. It is gushing with oil. It's a gusher for the term that was used then. And then. And then life was not the same anymore, friends. This is not a fake story. It's real. Go and Google Yates Pool. It's a very famous oil field there in West Texas, USA. And from then on, Ira Yates' life is never the same anymore. He became a millionaire overnight. And with that first oil well that was drilled, it was able to produce 80,000 barrels of oil per day. What seems like him living in poverty then and then, and then he struck jackpot, he found gold, and now he lives life as a millionaire. He was sitting on a plot of land with immense potential that he wasn't aware of. Friends, do you know something? You and I as Christ follower has possessed immense potential and resource within our grasp. The Holy Spirit in us. Tap on the Holy Spirit because it's going to bring you immense power of how it's going to help you to live a powerful Christian life. Preaching to you today from Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 to 26. Turn to the Bible. Let's look at the scripture. I'm going to read it for all of us here. And then we will look at a passage, Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 to 16. Now here it says, I'll read it for you. You have the Bible there. I'll read it for you. And then here it goes. It says, now... You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge your flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. But love your neighbour as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. Now, verse 16 goes on. So, I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. 
For the flesh desire what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you're not to do whatever you want. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now, verse 19, 20 is quite a mouthful. You must finish it in one breath. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, which is patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such thing, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passion and desire. Verse 25, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And verse 26 goes on, ah, let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. From this passage here today, you learn very three important aspects of what it means to live life in the Spirit. Last week, we talked about what it means to live life in freedom. How is freedom expressed out? And today we talk about the Holy Spirit, the forgotten friend that is going to be at work in our life. Three very important things. Living in the Spirit expresses itself in love and service to others. It helps us to overcome our fleshly carnal nature. That's part two, verse two, uh, the second part. And the last part here, empower us to a righteous living. And then let's look at the first part here. The first thing here is this. Now, how the living out the Holy Spirit in our life, right? It's expressed in our love and service to others. Verse 13 comes in to tell us this. It says, Now, friends, 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 you are called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. The word indulge here means must not give an opportunity. You must not give the flesh a chance to take hold of you to live the kind of life that you shouldn't be living. The friends, here is this one thing. If you must understand the Galatians church then, then the setting then, then. Because many times people say, ah, the Galatians church, they are so weak in their faith. I'm not going to be like that. And there was this thing about circumcision and then not living by the law. The thing here is this. The Galatians then then were really sincere believers like you and I. They came to faith. They came to know this Jesus by the experience of the power of the Holy Spirit. And then they came to know Jesus. But then some of them were really struggling. If you read the whole text here, some of the believers were struggling. Well, they have drinking issues. They have anger issues. They have they have issues managing their temper. They have managing, managing difficulties managing their lust. They had troubles. But then the thing here is this. They came to know Christ. And then so-called the legalists right, and the Judaizers are telling them, now friends, once you come to know this Jesus, right, you need to carry on to maturity. You know the things that you're struggling, right? There is a solution. And then the believers, the young believers were sincere. Say, oh, tell us the, the solution to this. Now, first, get circumcised. And then you'll be right with God. The position you'll be right with God. And then the second thing, you need to follow the law. Because why? How are you going to discipline your appetite, the lust, and all the, the cravings and the desires, right? Follow the law of Moses. Because the law of Moses gives you a set of do's and don'ts. And then if you follow that, do that in your life, you'll be okay. Now, think of it in this way. If you're a new believer, what will you be thinking? Hey, hey, perhaps, right, if I do this, right, I'll be able to grow spiritually. So that's the, the implication then. Then um, the thing here, like people were asking, like the, the Paul's teaching about grace and grace alone, like it's fake, you know. Because what? You're going to swing to the other end. Then you're going to live life any oh how that you like. This freedom, or we call the licentiousness, then you can sleep around, fool around, and then you will be safe. No, that's not the way the people was telling them. The legalist was telling them. Then how should we live out their life? In answer to that argument, right? Hey, if you just follow grace alone, right, you're going to live a licentious life. Paul is saying here in verse 13, he says, no, no, no. Once we come to know Christ, don't abuse your freedom, but live out their life. Verse 13, put it up there. He says, now live out your life. Express that. Express that. How not to be, to, to swing to the other end of living a life that is licentious. He says, now serve 
and love one another humbly in love. So that it says now, serve one another humbly in love. Don't abuse your freedom in Christ. Then verse 14, he says now, this is Paul quoting the word of Jesus. He says now, for the entire law is fulfilled in obeying or keeping. If you want to keep law, right, just keep this one very important law. Love your neighbours as yourself. How does loving our neighbour as ourselves expressed through in our daily walk with the Lord. This neighbour here is not just your next door neighbour, your upstairs neighbour or your downstairs neighbour because it, it, it's, it involves people who are near you. You will underst understood that, right? People in your workplace, your family, those that are near you, they are your neighbours. As a church, we are, we are full on in this aspect about loving our neighbours block by block. You know, that's a very practical way of how our love, our faith expresses itself in love. Verse 6, right? Galatians, last week we talked about faith expressing itself in love. And then how here talks about, right? You've got to live out that freedom. You've got to love and serve others. It could be a simple thing like knocking on doors, talking to people who are very different from you, giving them a gift. If the need, if the opportunity comes, right? Praying for the person, connecting with the person, and then visiting that person when the need comes, Perhaps you can cook a meal, share with your neighbour, or perhaps a, a worker in a workplace, even in your workplace, someone who needs help in the work, helping them, explaining to them, walking it through with them patiently, that is serving one another in love. Then here in verse 15, it brings out a contrast. A warning, in fact, Paul was telling the churches, now if you keep on, right, biting and devouring one another, watch out you destroy one another. Have you ever watched BBC Animal Planet? You know those instances where the, the documentary shows you the feeding frenzy of the animals and the beasts, right? It's like telling you a mental picture, right? If you're inward looking to your own needs, then there comes a point of time, right, where the church will destroy itself. That's why we always believe that as a church, even as we care for our people, disciple our people, let's be outward looking. Let's go out to meet the needs of others. How does that work out in your life group, in the ministry that you are? Some very practical ways. Do you see people who are new joining your life group and your community? The most loving thing that you can do for them, right, is to go up to them, welcome them, introduce yourself to them and say hi to them. The most inward thing that can happen is, oh, that person is new. Then you gather your holy huddle and then you talk among themselves. There's a visitor that, never mind, let him settle his own, and let's talk, let's catch up a bit, you know, precious, precious time, let's catch up. No, 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 that's not the way. The, the, how we go about loving others is like when you see someone that you're not familiar in a life group, go out, introduce yourself, talk to them, connect with them. The friends, here is this the basis of our service and our faith is love. Look, keeping a lookout for others. And that's how the Holy Spirit enables us to reach out to love and to serve. I've mentioned to us many times, freedom comes not just anything we want to do, but it is the freedom to love others and to serve others. Yeah, uh, but truth be told, right, many a times I'm like an uh, introvert. Given the choice, right, I, I want to sit at one corner and then be on my own and then don't disturb me. But then I know that when the Holy Spirit works in me, I know that I can look out for others, I can be outward looking. Tell the person next to you, now the Holy Spirit works in you. Keep a lookout for others. And then so we say we serve one another humbly in love. Then the second part here, the Holy Spirit enables us to overcome our fleshly desires. Paul says, now quit the infighting. Quit the biting of one another. And then he says here in verse 16, and so I say, here is the resolution for you and I. Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And then goes on to say verse 17, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with one another so that you are not to do whatever you want. It's like an image of a tug of war. Some of you have a mental image. On one side, right, it's the, it's the fleshly desire tugging on one end of the rope. And then on the other hand, right, you'll be thinking it's like the, the, the 
the spirit upon you tugging on the other hand. Sometimes you feel this, this tug and this pull, right? Oh gosh, I'm going to give in to my flesh, do whatever I want. Or no, 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 the spirit is on, is on me. I'm going, to, I'm going to live out a righteous life. So there's this tug of war pulling on one end and then dragging you on the other end. The, the thing here is this, right? Sometimes we, we do feel those inner impulses, right? Trying to, trying to overcome us, tempt us, you know, do it, do it. If it looks good, then it feels good, then you can do it. If it looks good, then um, it's going to be good, you know, just go for it. It seems like uh, there's this war going on. Uh, but the thing here is this. If you look careful enough, right, this tug of war, right, the flesh and the spirit, right, right at the end of the rope, right, the cross anchors on this end, on the side of the spirit. Though you feel sometimes, right, you get pulled on the other end of the flesh, right, be reminded you are not going to be defeated because why? The cross is anchoring your faith there and there on the spot. You just need to hold on tightly to the rope. You just need to continue to live in the Spirit. You know what? You are victorious, positionally victorious. Yes, you get tempted, pulls at you. you. You try to get angry. There's this side you are tempted to watch on the internet, pulling at you. But then when you stand firm, when you know that the Spirit is working in you, and you know that you have the final victory that is in Christ, that your faith is anchored upon the cross, you have the power that enables you to overcome the flesh. And then verse 18 goes on to say, Now then, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. This verse here is very important. Two key aspects here for us to really grasp and understand here. What do I mean when I say when I'm led by the Spirit? And what do I mean when I say that I'm not under the law? Notice this thing here. When we are led by the Spirit, right? His presence, the Holy Spirit's presence is at work in your life. His presence and His purification power frees you from guilt, shame, judgment, condemnation. it got to be discerned, friends. When the Holy Spirit is at work in your life, you know that all things that are clean, that is pure, that is peaceable, is going to come into your heart work in your life and you know that in Christ, right? Even though at life juncture in your life that goes on, there are things that you do that you fall short, you, are, you feel that sense of guilt, but then you're not burdened by it. You can take that guilt, come to God through the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, I've done something that is not right, but Lord, would you cleanse me, renew me, restore me. His presence and His purification power frees you, cleanse you, renews you, restores you. I don't know about you, friends, uh, but many a time, sometimes I, I think that I don't want to talk to the Holy Spirit. Or I have a question, how does the Holy Spirit really talk to me? How many have this question in your mind? How does the Holy Spirit really talk to me? And then um, I have instances whereby sometimes you know, I don't want to talk to God right now, you know, because if I talk to the Holy Spirit, He will ask me to do something that I don't want to do. Right now. True or not true? Sometimes we experience that. Some of you are nodding, yeah. Then how do you discern or differentiate, at least have a sense of discernment, whether it is your inner voice, inner thought, or it is the prompting of the Holy Spirit? I give you something very helpful. And then today, end of the service, you go back, you come into the Lord's presence. These are the things that I, I want you to understand. Mind you, right, when we come into the Lord's presence, when the Holy, Holy Spirit speaks to us, there are something that undergirds, right? The Word of God, one thing, one aspect, check back, whatever, you receive, check back to the Word. That's one aspect. And then the other aspect, talk to people wise, wiser than you, your mentors, your leaders, your pastor, talk to them when you're making decisions. So the Bible, mentors, through working through people, and then through prayer, which is the part about engaging the Holy Spirit, these three aspects, when they come in line, you know that this is where God is leading you. This is direction that where God is leading you. So how do you discern? I give you three very important aspects. The Holy Spirit when he wants to work in your life and wants to speak to you, he usually convicts you. Conviction is not condemnation. If you come into the presence and then you hear voices like, ah, you cannot make it, lah. you failed again. You see, you loser, and then you have negative thoughts, those are condemnation. But the Holy Spirit will convict you. Why? I did it again, but help me, Lord. 
The Holy Spirit will give you the conviction and say, I will change. I will be better. I will do better. Because I have a second chance in Christ. That's conviction. Conviction releases you to go closer to God, to pursue God. Condemnation causes you to draw further and further away from God. So that's the number one. Then the, the ne next thing here is He illuminates. The Holy Spirit doesn't impose on you. The scripture talks about the Holy Spirit that comes on us. It's like a gentle dove. You remember that passage? When Jesus uh, came out from the water, the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. It's gentle. So then we say that we need to read the Bible because the Bible is our, what we call it, a manufacturer's manual. God's manufacturer's manual to us. And when the scripture says that when we meditate on the word, we will find good success. Not just success, friends. I want to encourage you to read the Bible. We can have success, but success at the cost of our family life, spiritual life, but then we can have good success when we follow the Word of God. Good success means that we prosper spiritually, not just materially. Good success means that we will have our family intact. You see people working their socks off, right, just to get success in the corporate world, but that success comes at a cost to their family life. Their kids leave them, their family, their wife leaves them. But then, when we follow the Word of God, we know that we can have good success and that's the promise of the Word. So, when we, read the, when we read the word, it illuminates. Certain passage, you read, hey, this jumps out at me. Those are instances that God is speaking to you. You can choose not to follow because He won't impose, but the Holy Spirit will continue to illuminate. Circumstances, open doors, those are instances that, hey, the Holy Spirit is revealing to you that He is guiding you and leading you. And then the thing here is this, he will guide you, not guilt trip you. Hey, you better do it. Nah. If not, nah, you know, something bad will happen to you. That's guilt tripping. But the Holy Spirit will guide you step by step, one open door to another open door, one circumstance to another circumstance. Everything happens by divine appointment. It's not a random chance. So then you'll know that the Holy Spirit is working in your life. You possess immense resource. And you've got to tap on it engage the Holy Spirit. And so then here it says the, when we are under, when we are led by the Spirit, we are not under the law. Then verse 19 to 21 talks about the 15 vices here. Uh, it's not an exhaustive list. Uh. Uh, for those who are very discerned, one, they'll know that uh, in other parts of the letter or the epistles, right, Paul will throw in other vice and virtues. We call this the vice and virtues list. Uh, in here, in this part here, there's 15 vices. I'll just run through some of it with you, but then the key thrust, right, can be found in verse 26 when you read together with verse 20. I think it's verse 20. Uh, let's look at the, i just summarize for you, right? I won't run through the verse. I'll just summarize for you. Give me the 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 part about the, the sins that, these vices that Paul is talking here about. The part about here, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, right? Uh, Paul is talking about sexual sins. If there's one thing, right, the devil will mess you up real good, right? Mess you up sexually. That's how it's going to work, right? Extramarital affairs, unnatural sex, now all these are impure. Sexual immorality. And then it goes on to say, now, religious sin, which is idolatry and witchcraft. Um, the last part here about drunkenness and orgies, right? If you look at the Bible, this orgies here, and this is not sexual orgies. It's talking about drinking orgies. That people start drinking, once they start, cannot stop. And then they get drunk, and when they get drunk, they get into all sorts of troubles and problems. And Paul was speaking out against all these things, right? Giving you a sense that, you know, when you are in the flesh, it feels like you're swimming in sewerage. It's polluting, it's putrid, it's smelly, it's terrible, it's stifling. Therefore, he puts on the 15 vices to put a picture to you that, hey, you can't live life in the flesh. It pollutes. Um, but what is helpful here, you look at the, in the middle part here about the relational sins, the part about hatred, about jealousy, envy, and then selfish ambition, dissension, da da da, etc., etc. Um, let's go on to that part about relational sins. Uh, one more slide down, and then we'll talk about hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage. And then the next one, the next slide. 
Selfish ambition, dissension, faction, envy. Do you notice something here? All this sin will only occur in a relationship. Some sins you commit on your own. But then these relational sins here, uh, just quickly run through. What's the difference between jealousy and envy? You know? Jealous means what? I'm not happy that you have this thing because I also want it. That's jealousy. Yeah? When I go to the, to the, to the car park, right? And I see, whoa, nice car, fast car, expensive car. I'm jealous because I also want that car. That's jealousy. Uh, but then there's good jealousy also, right? God is jealous. Why? God is jealous for us because He wants that exclusive relationship with us. That's God's jealousy for us. But then our human jealousy is like, it's like the craving for the things that we don't have. I want it, but I don't have it. Then it gives me that kind of bad kind of feeling. Then what's envy? Envy here is also that kind of feeling. What you have, I don't have. I may not want it, but I'm just not happy you have it. That's envy. Oh, that guy has got a promotion. Now he's the director. I'm so envious. But does, do I want to be a director? Maybe not. But then I'm just, envy. I'm just envious that he's the director. I'm not. So that's feeling of envy. Um, but the thing here is this, right? The recurring part of all this thing about this relational scene, right, can be found in verse 26. He says, Now let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Now then it becomes so clear, right, in the book of Galatians, right, what came into the picture about this fight against circumcision, not following the law, is actually about pride, you know. Uh, what is conceded? A colloquial term here means, con if you are conceded, means you are stuck up. Lah. That's just another way to define if you are con He says now, Paul is telling them, now friends, friends in this church, they say, Galatians, don't be stuck up. Don't have the sense of pride. Because ultimately, right, all this relational sin about hatred, fits of rage, dissension, faction, envy, all these things, right, all this whole nine yards, right, the root cause of all these things, right, is pride. You can, you can really trace all this back to pride. Because of pride, I try to create dissension. I disagree with you. Well, sometimes you know, right? People disagree not for the sake of disagreeing. They, uh, people disagree not because of the right and the wrong way of doing things. Because people disagree because they have a disagreeable spirit. They just want to disagree with you for the sake of disagreeing with you. Why? Pride. But uh, how do you know that uh, pride is bad? Because, okay, we know all pri pride is bad. But do you know that we all have pride? You say, no, la, I'm very humble one. You know, I'm not prideful. Um, you know, how the best way to know whether you are prideful is when people who is proud, who is proud right, snub you. Do you hate people who are proud? They speak to you in a, in a, in a top-down kind of tone and then you get very angry, right? Nah, you, you hate that, right? But many a times, right, you, it's not like you hate that person who is speaking to you in a top-down manner. You hate it because why? You feel like you are being given a snub. That's pride. That's pride. And Paul is telling us here, you know, friends, we've got to put down our pride, our preference, and then work for the common good of the body of Christ. Now, the thing here is this, right? Uh, let's go to verse 20. Uh, let's go to verse, no, before that. The thing here is this. When we have pride, when there are these relational sins in our life, right, it destroys fellowship and relationship. True or not true? When there's pride in the life group or in the family or in the workplace, right? It destroys the fellowship. It destroys the working relationship. It destroys the family relationship. Uh, one practical, practical examples here. Now in the family, right? You know, parents have kids and then sometimes they have two kids, three kids, right? And then when parents fight, right? Parents, okay, spouses will fight. Yes, we do fight. But the thing here is, right, when you fight, right? Try not to sow discord and dissension in the family. You know how we do that? We go to our kid and say, you know, huh? your daddy always like that one. You know, that's why I disagree with you. You are sowing discord and dissension. It's true. By, by you telling your kid you're sowing that bitter seed, and then you're, how will your kid understand? Oh, no, oh yeah, no, daddy is like that one. No? And then the next time round when the parents fight, right, the kid will join you. Know, daddy, why are you always like that? 
How come you always bully mommy, you know? Because why? The spouse sow seeds of discord and then cause a disagreeable spirit in the family. How does pride come in in our workplace? Have you ever been in a meeting and then the boss charts the direction? This is our target, sales target, friends, countrymen. And then this is our goal, this is our direction that our company is going. And then they talk about the plans, blah, blah, blah. And then they ask, any of you has any objection? Quiet. Everybody look at the boss. Mm, very good. And then boss says, happy. End of meeting. And then what happens? Everybody, all the manager go out, middle management go out. You know what? Wow, this boss sucks. Ah. All this goes crazy one. How can we meet the goal? You think can, ah, you ask him to go. You know, you know that's what happened among us? dissension and then we gossip and then you know this you know because the boss pressed him now he's pressing us and then we gossip you know when we are in the flesh that's what's happening in our lives that's a better way to live right uh, the thing here is this let's be aware you know the, the next time when you feel like uh, you're going to share something bad or gossip about others right pray in the spirit and then when you're praying in the spirit you cannot gossip one true or not true and then when you want to, when you want to um, pick a fight with your spouse, right, you start praying the Spirit. When you pray in the Spirit, you cannot quarrel with your wife or you cannot quarrel with your spouse. So then that's practically how we're going to live it out in our life. But ultimately, right, in verse 21, he says now, um, put verse 21 up there for, for me. And he says this in verse 21, ultimately, right, when when we cannot carry on living this life. He says, Paul says, I warned you, I warned you as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. I've already shared with us many times, fullest measure of God's grace. Let there be no room com of complacency in our life. The same thing here, you know, when we come to life in the Spirit, we need to engage the Holy Spirit. Get connected with Him, fellowship with Him. Some of us may be thinking, right? Oh, you know this, praying the spirit and then living a spirit-filled life is a it's a deluxe luxury version of Christianity. Don't you feel that way sometimes? But A. W. Tozer says this, no, um, this part about being spirit-filled, right? It's not a special deluxe edition of Christianity. He says, no, no, no. You and I, we gotta be, we gotta be aware that you know, living a spirit-filled life is part and parcel of all God's people. It's God's plan for all of us to be filled with His Spirit, to live out that life that overcomes the flesh, that enables us, to empower us to live a life that is righteous. And then it goes on, it says, now now that you go through that, that whole 15 vices, right, the feel that we get is chaotic, is dark, is insidious, is sinister. And then here in verse 22, it says, now the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And then against such thing, there is no law. Put verse 21 up there. Look at it. It's a list of virtues here again. But then you know something. What undergirds all this thing here is love. God's love. If you remember in Galatians 5, 6, it says now faith expressing itself in love. Yeah? And then, then in verse 13, he says now we are to serve one another humbly in love. And then now here it says the fruit of the Spirit is love. When there is love in our hearts, in our life, there will be joy. When we know that God loves us, we go through things that are difficult, there will be peace. When God's love is in us, somebody is irritating us, we can be forbearing, patient. Or in this sense here, when we go through trials, there will be patience. And then it goes on, when there's love, there is kindness towards others. When there is love, there is goodness. When there is love, there is faithfulness in our life. So then here it says, now the true test of whether you're living in legalism or in another sense, in the opposite extreme of licentiousness, the true test here is, are you in love with God? Are you receiving the love of Jesus into your life and then expressing it out in service to others and in love for others? So then it runs through then in verse 24. 
put verse 24 here now. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. When I read this, I have a few questions in my mind. I don't know whether you have that question. Now, the thing here is this. We are to live a victorious life in the Spirit. Yes? And then here says that when we come to Christ, we put to death our flesh. With the death of the flesh, our passions and desires. I heard this story recently. It's a real story. A Bible study among the Caleb group, elders, the elderly, those in their 70s and 80s, then they were sharing this part about holiness and sanctification. And then the, those, uh, there's this brother in the 80s, and he shared, you know, very openly, he says, now, you know, at my age, I still get tested in the area of lust. He shares that openly. And this is real, no, friends? Because sometimes we think that, ha, huh, this thing about lust, right, I think I'll get better when I age. This thing about patience and anger, right, I think when I grow older, right, I will mellow down. People tend to think that when you age, right, it gets better. Yeah, that principle only applies if you're eating aging steaks. Steaks, if you age it, tastes better, right? No. Christian maturity doesn't get better when you age. Christian maturity only gets better when we allow the Holy Spirit to work within us. So then he is saying this now. Um, why then do I still face temptation? Why do I lust? Why do I feel angry? Fits of anger? Here is saying this one thing here. That though you face all these things, right? This thing will never, never, ever drive or determine how you respond and live out your life. Because here he's saying, now once you put all this on the cross, you acknowledge Jesus is the saviour of my soul, he saved me from my sin, you put your passions and their desires on the cross and with that, it's not going to drive you. That desire and the inner impulses right, will not drive you in your decision making and how you're going to live out your life. That's the real deal here. How do we practically live that out in our life? While the passions and the desires are real, they are present, they should no longer have a hold over us and our life. Then the thing here is this, how am I going to practically live out this life of empowerment, this life in a spirit that overcomes the flesh? I think that's the question that always people have. Yeah, I know the preacher is trying to tell me, pray in the spirit, get baptized in the Holy Spirit, and then pray in the spirit. And then, but then the thing here is like, how do I practically live it out in my life? I tell you a real story. I think some of you have heard this story. I work as an engineer and got to travel like uh, Robert, got to go overseas on business trip. You know, there was once I was in this country, right? Um, the client booked me in into a very nice hotel. And then after dinner from, uh, from the supplier, it's the supplier, you know, nice lavish dinner, welcome, 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 finish the dinner and then I was sent back to my own room and then I was alone with um, going back to my room and then went into the lift, right? And then midway through at this level three, ding, the lift stopped. Then room, the door opened. And then I see neon lights flashing, you know. For, for a brief moment of time, whoa. And then I, I peer out and see, wow, it's a nightclub. A nightclub in the hotel, very convenient, right? And then lo and behold, um, one guy with two ladies came in. Well, the lady is really dressed uh, low cut, low cut, and then uh, short skirt. And then the, the guy with two girls, then, wow, well, my imagination runs wow. Nightclub, guy with two girls, and then, wow, my, all my senses were engaged. You know, the blinking neon light, and then the ladies walking in, the perfume, well, fills my senses for a brief moment. And then they were, the guy's hand were all over the ladies, and then. Just for a brief moment, then, of course, they left on another floor. And then I was left alone in the lift. And then when I was on the way back to my hotel room, wow, a lot of thoughts came to my mind. Nightclub downstairs. Like. I've never been before. Ma. Maybe I should go take a look. Downstairs. I'm alone. Nobody knows. Ma. My wife won't know. Ma. If I don't tell her, she won't know. I go 
Maybe experience, not bad. Right? Then another thought come to my mind. Hey, maybe I should go in, book, book a table with a lady and then talk to her and evangelize to her, right? <laughs> hey, that's like spiritual. And I'm doing God's work. Hey, seriously, friends, don't laugh. Ah. This really goes through my mind. It says, maybe I should really do that. Then for a brief moment, like I was walking back to my room and then I stopped. I wanted to turn back. And then you know what happens? Ding! SMS came in. My boss was asking me, how was your dinner appointment with the supplier? I, What's the update? Oh, my boss come. You know, when your boss come, you must, what? Reply, right? So I quickly went back to my room and then replied the messages and then he wanted a report from me. And then, and then in my room, I was busy working out, typing out a report sent to my boss. Ah, then I realized, yay, I overcome my fleshly nature. I beat all my excuses. Um, but then I was, for a brief moment, I was thinking, mm, well done, you know, you overcome the flesh. But then I realized something, it was by God's grace, right, that, that God gave me an opportunity that, uh, to overcome my flesh. Uh, read Corinthians, then this part about Corinthians chapter Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and then he says, now if you are being tempted, now friends, uh, read this passage here. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, he says, now friends, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, you will, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Friends, Devil has a scheme, but God has a way. When you are tempted next time to lash out at others or when you are fiercely tempted to give in to your lust, to your passions and to the desires, then pray in the Spirit, talk to God. God is merciful. He will give you a way out. That's the thing I'm trying to help us to understand. You have in your possession immense potential and power at your disposal. Are you aware of that? A story I was told was about Sahara Unveiled. It's a book, not recommended reading. Uh, it's a travel log. I, I like the book, the, the way they write about this guy, an Algerian guy, went on a trip with his companion across the Sahara Desert. So this Algerian guy called Lek Lek, with his companion, drove through the Sahara Desert, but midway through the journey, their truck broke down. And then they were stranded in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Temperature is scorching hot. They had plenty of food, but then, through the experience, they were stranded in the desert for three weeks. The, you know what's the terrible thing to die, right? In the desert? It's not starvation, they say. It's thirst and for three weeks even though they had enough food they ran out of water and even as they wait for help to come and then Lek Lek was describing the various stages of thirst that they go through I didn't, I didn't know that actually there's so many levels of thirst he says now the first level of thirst they call this the eudipsia which is the normal thirst now that you Listen to me, then you feel a bit thirsty, right? You are you dipsia, you can drink a bit. That's the normal thirst. And then you come to a point of time if you don't quench that thirst, you get hyper dipsia. That's like a temporary but intense thirst. That's the body telling you that you need to drink, you need to drink, you need to drink. But then they say they went beyond you dipsia, hyper dipsia, they are in polydipsia. That's the stage whereby it is a sustained, intensive, excessive thirst. And then they were saying, they will drink anything that they can see. And then they coined another term. They call this the, what you drink, right? Eurydipsia. You want to guess what is Eurydipsia? No? They will drink urine. The thirst is so intense, they will drink their own urine. And then for another term that I learned recently, right? If you don't get urine, perhaps there comes a point in time where you have hemodipsia. You drink blood. Um, but then Lek Lek was saying that for a lack of a better term to describe, of course they didn't drink blood, but then they found another source of liquid. You know what? The 
coolant in the car engine radiator. They say they don't have a term for that. Lah. But then they were so thirsty that they were even willing to drink the coolant in the radiator. He says, then, you know what? Coolant is poison. You know, friends, you and I sometimes get so thirsty in our life that we are even willing to drink poison. I'm not talking about physical thirst. I'm talking about this spiritual thirst. And so I say to you, friends, you possess, you have in your possession this immense power. Engage it, which is the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says this, Come, all you who are thirsty. And then he says what? Drink through the Holy Spirit. And my encouragement for all of us here is life in the Spirit far better than anything else in this world that we experience. How then can we practically engage the Holy Spirit? I know some of you here will have this question. Well, it's praying in tongues, right? But that's how you hear. Praying in tongues sometimes is just like mindless babbling. I just pray a few words and then it's just that. Um, but I want to teach you something practically. At the end of the day, at the day I'm going to give you some give you an opportunity to work that out through a time of worship. Three things here. How do you engage the Spirit? You start slow. Slow. Remember the first word, slow. And then, slow means you just come into the Lord's presence. You say, Lord, I have a lot of distraction right now. Even now when I'm talking to you, you start slowly. Maybe you are thinking like what to, what to have for lunch afterwards. Or maybe you have something weighing on your mind. It's your job. Something about your children, about your kids is distracting you. Or some issues that you are facing, come slow. Come in the Lord's presence. Says, in your mind, says, these are the things that I'm going through, Lord. You take over, you take over, and then you sustain it. You come slow, you sustain it, you begin to pray in the Spirit. You begin to pray in tongues, you sustain it. And the Scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 4, he says, now, if I pray with my Spirit, I engage God, and then I will pray in my mind so that you'll be fruitful. So then you sustain it and then you start praying in the Spirit and then you engage in the Spirit and then you end strong. Simple, right? Start slow, sustain it, end strong. And this is what we're going to do. Let's put aside our things. In a moment's time, I'm going to speak to all our fellow Christ followers here. All of us, most of us are baptised in the Spirit. I want us to pray out in tongues and then experience that refreshing and that renewal power in our life. For some of you here, you've been prayed for on numerous occasions, but then you're not able to pray out in tongues. I want to encourage you. You have received the gift. You know what? In your tongue, your tongue is just like the gate to the dam. Open that gate, move your tongue, and then the immense power will flow through you in your life. Can I invite all of us to stand over this place?